All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for loving us. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus to be our wonderful Savior. And this time of year especially, we think of the incarnation and the birth of Jesus. But today we're going to look at his entire life and death and resurrection, what the whole plan of salvation means to us, and what Seventh-day Adventists have to offer to the world in way of their view of the gospel. We, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in Acts chapter 17, that's the first text, if you're going to be writing text down, Paul and Silas were preaching the gospel, and so powerfully that the people there in Thessalonica felt as if the world was being turned upside down. And so this was just an amazing uh, <clears throat> transformation that was taking place there in Thessalonica. Now, if the sermon could be summed up in a sentence, in case you don't make it through 45 minutes, here you go in one sentence, but hopefully you will. God has a movement that is taking a message that will finish the mystery once and for all. Now, I want you to say this with me, but you just say the M words, the ones that are in bold, movement, message, mystery, all right? Let's do this together. God has a that is taking a that will finish the once and for all. Thanks. You guys were great. Now, what is this mystery? Or you're saying, well, it's a mystery. That's why we can't know it. No, we can know the mystery. Colossians 1.27 says, Even the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the mystery, or what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, and what does it say in the red there? Can you even read it? No, you can't. Christ in you. Sorry, I won't use red next time. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so that's the key to the mystery. The message that turned the world upside down is still alive today. A uniquely Adventist perspective. Sometimes we say that the sanctuary is our only unique thing that we offer to all of Christianity. Well, I agree that the sanctuary is, but the sanctuary represents something. It represents how God saves people. And that's what Seventh-day Adventists have to offer to the world, a uniquely distinctive plan of salvation. It's about grace. In fact, way more grace. And not just grace, a different kind of grace. Not just forgiving grace, but a grace that empowers Amen. you to keep the Ten Commandments. Now, this is not just about information. Sometimes Adventists are accused of just being about, oh, well, you guys, you know, share lots of information. Well, I mean, duh. I mean, <laughs> the Bible's full of information. But it's not about information, primarily. It's about a relationship with our eternal Father. Amen? Amen? With a living God. Can you have a relationship with God in heaven? That is the key. God has given this movement, and I say it humbly, a complete system of truth connected and harmonious. That's in a book called The Great Controversy 423. A complete system of truth. That's what we offer to the world, to all of Christianity. God honoring alone. <clears throat> I loved David, our, uh, our um, Sabbath school lesson. It was a very difficult one. We went through Daniel 8, but <clears throat> uh, David did a great job with it. But we see that truth is progressive. It's also connected. Proverbs 4.18 says that the path of the just is as a light that shines more and more unto the what? unto the perfect day, right? So truth is progressive. You may learn something, and then as you continue to learn it, you learn, it becomes deeper, right? That's the way truth, that's the way Bible truth is. In the 1840s, there were Adventists, not Seventh-day Adventists, they didn't know about the Sabbath yet, <clears throat> and they believed in a pre-millennial second coming. That's what bound them all together. That is, the second coming would happen before the millennium. Then the sanctuary in two phases primarily came into being the holy and the most holy place. Then the Sabbath truth came, so truth was progressive. Then the three angels' messages were seen in their light, but all of it was connected together by the righteousness of Christ. And that is the foundation of the gospel. We'll be going through that today. 
Today in Christianity, there are two main schools of thought when it comes to soteriology. That word is simple. It just means the study of salvation. And they are Arminians and Calvinists. They both get their names from their founders. Okay, and you have that there. <clears throat> Calvinists are, and these are general, general terms. You may know some people that don't fit quite into the categories, so keep that in mind. Calvinists, Calvinism generally you'll find in Presbyterian, Calvinists, Assembly of God, Baptists, Evangelicals, Reformed churches. Arminianism you'll find mainly, and there's Wesleyan Arminianism in Methodist churches, Baptist churches, Seventh-day Adventists tend to be Arminian, Nazarene, and Charismatics. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the... Calvinist churches have a little acronym for their understanding of salvation, and it's TULIP. Okay, so each of these letters represent something. And we're going to take a quick look at this, just so you can get a little bit of history of this. The T stands for total depravity, man's total depravity. In other words, you couldn't decide to accept Christ even with his help. You're so depraved after the fall of Adam, there's no way, way you, could, you could possibly get there. Okay, that's their basis. Now, with that as the basis, the you then is unconditional election. Since you can't get there, there's no way you can get there, someone has to get you there. So who does it? God does it. He elects both the saved and the unsaved, otherwise known as double predestination. When don't, don't worry about all the terms. Get the concepts. Okay, so God does the electing unconditionally. The L is for limited atonement. It's not for everybody. There's no, everybody cannot be saved in Calvinism. God is going to choose who can and who can't. I know, isn't that interesting? <laughs> Dell's shaking his head. But that's what the Calvinists believe. God chooses. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Now, the last two, irresistible grace and preservance of the saints, have to basically do with once saved, always saved. Now, when they say irresistible grace, it doesn't mean you can't resist grace at all, but you can't resist it unto death. You, eventually, you're gonna, if God chose you, eventually you're going to give in. And then preservance of the saints has to do with, again, once saved, always saved. <clears throat> now, listen to this. Calvinism teaches that Christ died only for the elect, and salvation is available only to a few which God chooses. Well, that sounds wonderful. I mean, God is sovereign. He can choose. He's going to know who to choose correctly, but listen to why that's a problem. I was taking a class at Calvin College. I tried to take a biblical preaching class in different places, <clears throat> um, and when I was in Grand Rapids, I took one from Calvin College. Don't look at me like I fell off the ship, okay? Uh, when you take a biblical <laughs> preaching, I'm just kidding with you guys. When you take a biblical preaching class, all you're learning is how to preach. They don't teach you doctrine or any of that. But I was at a meeting there at, at Calvin College, and this lady came in. And she was distraught. She said, you know, I just don't understand God. And so the, some of the professors were trying to console her. What, what do you mean? You don't well, God chose me, but my son has gone off. He doesn't even believe in God anymore. So why did God choose me? But he didn't choose my son. Now, listen to this carefully. Who does the blame go on in Calvinism? Because she had it right. She had the theory right. Who does the blame go on if you're lost in Calvinism? God, you got it, right? God is to blame, and that's not correct, amen? That's not the gospel. If we are to be lost at last, it won't be because of God's fault. The true gospel says, if we're saved at last, that'll be because of God. If we're lost at last, that'll be on us, amen? Because he's done everything possible for our salvation, and that's what this Christmas season is really all about. Now, Arminianism has an answer to everything Calvinism puts forth. And here is their answer. <clears throat> no, man wasn't totally depraved after the, after the fall. The image was just damaged. God can still work through man. Instead of unconditional election, no, no, it's conditioned upon man's choice. Now you might be saying, well, this sounds, yeah, this sounds like what I believe. Also, Christ died for all men. And it is our free choice 
whether to accept or not, and that's why man can fall. You can have salvation, but then you can give it up if you choose to. God allows your own free choice, okay? <clears throat> that's Arminianism, or classic Arminianism. Now listen to it as we get down to the base, ad, the base of it. Teaches that Christ died for all, but you must ignite the, the fire by your confession, faith, repentance, etc. In other words, yes, God has done something, but it's like a washing machine. It won't start until you put in the coins. <laughs> now, Calvinists look at Adventists and other Arminians and say, oh, that is so anthropocentric. Anthropos just means what? Mankind, right? That's man-centered. Oh, that's so, oh, I mean, God's out of the picture. You're, it's all about you guys. <clears throat> well, I want to put forth to you today that something came to this church around the year 1888 that was better than Calvinism and better than Arminianism. It is the gospel that God gave to be taken to the world. It is the everlasting gospel. Now, look at the three views again. Calvinism is only for some. Not everybody can be saved no matter how hard you try. That's just some are elected, some are not. It's up to him. So if you're saved, God did it. If you're lost, God did it. Arminianism, this is for all, that's good news. But if you're saved, in a sense, now God died for all, and then you might argue with this, but I'm putting it forth anyway. <laughs> if saved, in a sense, I did it. If lost, I did it. Now the true gospel, if saved, God did it. If lost, yeah, that was me because I rejected, I resisted, I neglected unto damnation. Once again, Calvinism is the movement of God toward man, but not all men, because all men can't be saved. Arminianism practiced. God is there, but you must exercise faith before any blessings come to you. And that is not true. I'll prove it to you from the Bible. <clears throat> The biblical, the movement of God toward all men, life, health, air, food, our blessings to all because of the cross of Calvary. Salvation belongs to the human race, but it can be negated. All right, now here we go with the Bible. If you want to write these down, Matthew 5, 45. <clears throat> now today, the snow fell up there. Did you have rain pretty much everywhere here? Pretty much everywhere. So you had rain. This talk about rain and the sun shining. Now, when God sends the snow down, does it say, um, okay, here's some righteous people over here. I'm going to fall on them, but not on these people? Is that how the snow falls? Absolutely not, right? It falls on what? The just and the unjust alike. God blesses all. This is a quote. Christ came to show that his gift of mercy and love is as unconfined as the air the light, or the showers of rain that refresh the earth. They fall on all, just like his gift of mercy and love fall on all, the whole human race. So point number one, and there's five points. This one will take a while, the other four quite a bit quicker. <clears throat> because Christ died with no conditions, he didn't ask your opinion when he died on Calvary for the whole human race. No contingencies. He has actually accomplished something for every person alive. The fact that you can breathe today proves the reality of grace. It's as real as the air that circulates around the globe. And the cross is effective. Your choice has been purchased. Come on and say amen if that's good news. Christ died for the whole human race. Here's some more text on this. 1 Timothy 4, 9-11. <clears throat> This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Now, when you have an introduction like that, you know this is an important statement that's following. It's faithful, it's worthy of everybody accepting it. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of how many? All men, and then especially of those that believe. And then he says, these things command and teach so with that envelope, the statement before and the statement after it, this is an important statement. God is the Savior of all men, 
But of course, it's especially those that believe that enter into that relationship with it and can use it. Amen? Continuing on. Hebrews 2.9 But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for how many? For every man. Now, there are two deaths in the Bible. The first death that's spoken of is when we die, right? It's called a sleep. And everybody will face that death unless we're translated. That's, we're all, as one pastor put it, uh, Ophil put it, we're all old age positive, right? I mean, we're, we're all heading in that direction. <clears throat> now, the second death, that has to do with the hell of the Bible, the lake of fire, right? What, what we deserve for our sins, that's the second death. Now, Christ tasted death for every man. And the death he tasted was the second one, amen? He tasted what we should taste for our sins, okay? So if he tasted what we should taste for our sins, why do we have to taste it, amen? We don't. He's already tasted it. We're taking it back from him if we taste it ourselves. No one need die the second death because Christ already died it for the whole human race. Steps to Christ says this, the sinner may resist this love, may refuse to be drawn to Christ, but if he does not resist, what will happen? He will be drawn to Jesus. So our job is to not resist, not neglect, not reject so great a salvation as God has given. Now you might say, oh, yeah, pastor, but is this really that important? What was that? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> all right <clears throat> telephone phone ringing i don't know anyway <clears throat> you might wonder is this that important maybe the lord wants to make sure we're all still awake here um i don't know is there a doorbell out there maybe, maybe? doorbell no anyway so listen to this this is important <clears throat> the thought that the righteousness of christ is imputed to us not because of any merit of our own. Now we must, Seventh-day Adventists are big on the law, and, and we should be, because the law is, the, is, is what's really in, controverted, right, in the last days. But how do you approach the law? The law is not the basis of our salvation. It shows that we are, right, it's the fruit. We can't get it in the, in the wrong place, or else we'll constantly be in drudgery. That's what a statement has to say that I have later. Listen to this. Christ, his righteousness is imputed to us not on any merit of our part, but as a free gift. That's what the gospel says from God. It is a precious thought. The enemy of God and man is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented. Why? For he knows that if the people, if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. So this is crucial. You've got to understand this today. Fight that uh, urge to go to sleep on this one. All right, (laughs) a couple other scriptures, several other scriptures. For by one offering, this is at the cross, this is Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering he has, that is past tense, perfected forever. Wow, he is perfected forever? Them that are being, current tense, sanctified. Well, how is it that he, that we're perfect, but yet we're being sanctified? Well, again, it goes back to the cross, amen? What he did at Calvary, he did for the whole human race. But then as you, as you appreciate it, as you accept it, it works in you and you are sanctified by it. Colossians 2.10 says this, and you are complete in him you are complete in him not having your own righteousness but but the righteousness that he wrought out for you your imperfection is no longer seen for you're clothed with the robe of christ's perfection amen so when god looks down at you he's looking down but but he's looking down through a lens and the lens is the righteousness of christ amen So he doesn't see you, he doesn't see your imperfection, he sees the righteousness of Christ. 
And that's what God is doing in the sanctuary, what Christ is doing in the sanctuary right now. Oh, I love how E.J. Wagner put it in the book Glad Tidings. The judgment will reveal the fact that full salvation was given to every man and that the lost have deliberately thrown away their spiritual birthright possession. Powerful statement. Some more scriptures. This is Romans 5. So then, then, as through one man's transgression, there resulted condemnation to how many? To all. Who is the one man's transgression? Adam, Adam, right? Adam sinned, and we're all sort of part of him. We're we're his family, you could say. We're his uh, children. And so condemnation came to all. Even so, by the righteousness of one. Who's that one? Jesus Christ. The free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Amen. Christ became the second Adam, the second father of the human race, the last Adam. So the situation is this. It's not so much will you accept the gift. The gift has already been delivered to your house. Now many of you will be getting gifts this Christmas. You'll have be things delivered. But imagine if you took one and just set it in the corner and said, well, you know, I'm not sure. I don't know who sent it. You know, it could be a bomb in there. I'm not opening it up. Would you ever appreciate that gift? Would it really be a gift to you? No, but you do have it. It's there. And that's the same with salvation. That's what the Bible tells us. Romans 12, 3 says this, For I say through the grace of God given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to how many? Every man the measure of faith. Every man has a measure of faith. This is how Wagner put it in Romans, his commentary on Romans. This faith is dealt to every man even as Christ gave himself for every man or to every man. Do you then ask, what would prevent every man from being saved? The answer is nothing, except, now all all won't be saved, and there's a reason why, except the fact that all men will not keep the faith. If all would keep all that God gives them, all would be what? All would be saved. Unfortunately, all will not. Now, what does this truth do? Think about this. Christ died for all without any conditions, without any contingencies. He didn't die for you. And some people believe this, that he died, he only, he looked, he looked into the future and he saw, okay, this one and this one will accept it. So I'll die for them, but but I won't die for these because I know already that they won't accept it. No, no, that's not the Bible. Mary, Mary Magdalene's offering sort of illustrates the sacrifice of Christ. When she poured out that ointment, it was almost wasteful because it went all over the floor. It was everywhere. I mean, the the disciples, especially Judas, was really mad, right? Because he wanted to use that money for something else. But there it was everywhere. And such is the nature of the cross for us. Amen? For salvation. He gave it to everyone. And this changes how, it should change how we see God, how we see us, and how we see others. God is not one waiting to condemn us. He's not up there saying, well, you know, hope you make it, and I'm, you know, you know, but I've got my little book, and if you do something wrong, you know, I'll be, you know, I'll be writing that down, but hope you make it. That's not God, amen? He took the first step towards you, and he gave you his salvation. Now he's saying, please respond by faith, accept it, appreciate it, use it. There is no condemnation. When we died, we were in him. This in Christ motif is maybe one of the most prolific in the entire Bible. That is, what happened to Christ happened to you. And you're like, hold on, how does that work? Well, here, let me illustrate. I have the Bible, and I put, put the bulletin inside the Bible. I send the Bible with Aaron to Hawaii. By the way, you don't need any excuses to fly to Hawaii in January. You know that, Aaron? (laughs) No, I know. You have lots of reasons to go, but God bless you. I wish I could go in your baggage. 
But anyway, uh, <laughs> so if we, if we send this with Aaron, okay, so the, the bulletin is inside the Bible. If I send the Bible with Aaron to Hawaii, where does the bulletin go? It goes to Hawaii because it's in the Bible. That's what it means to be in Christ. He took the race in himself when he lived a perfect life. You don't have a perfect life to live. You've already messed it up. Unless maybe you're different. Anybody have a perfect life to offer Christ? No, right? <laughs> and the death, and the death that we deserve, right? He already died that death, and we were in him. And he's resurrected now, and we were in him. And so in him, that's why... Ephesians gives us this crazy, in him we sit in heavenly places. <laughs> and so when he died, we were in him. What a savior we have today. It changes the way we look at God. He took the first step. He's given me salvation. My job is to accept it, to rejoice in it, to share it with the lost world. Now listen to this. David, we talked about the sanctuary a little bit and what Christ is doing now. This is one of the most dynamite statements. Don't miss this. If you miss anything, don't miss this. And remember that <clears throat> because we're in Christ, you are accepted in Christ, in the beloved. Again, it's as if God's looking down through the lens of Christ and seeing you. Jesus stands in the holy of holies now to appear in the presence of God for us. There he ceases not. In other words, he's doing this consistently. He ceases not to present his people moment by moment. What does the last line say? Complete in him. Amen? You are completely in him. He's longing to present you as such. His strength or ours. You know, many times we... Think about the gospel and we think, okay, yeah, well, yeah, he did that, but, but now it's my job to hold his hand and he's kind of squirmy, you know, he's kind of squirmy, he's, he's pulling me. That's not it. He is holding your hand. Amen? Now, you can pull out. This is not once saved, always saved. This is not salvation for all. Anybody can lose salvation. If you choose to say goodbye to God, goodbye to life forever, he will not force you. There won't be anybody in heaven that <clears throat> will be there saying, well, yeah, I'm just here because he made me go. You know, like some kids go to church. <laughs> right? But that won't be the way in heaven. It's his strength. I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, fear not. I will help thee, the Bible says in Isaiah 41, 13. Listen to this. Neither life nor death, height nor depth, can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Not because we hold him so firmly, but because he holds us so fast. Isn't that good news? He is holding on. He is holding on. He is not letting go. If you choose to let go, he's like, man. I mean, it'll cause him tears, and, but he'll let you. But, if you, but he is going to hold you to the end. Amen? He will see you all the way to the kingdom. If our salvation depended upon our own efforts, I know all of you can agree that would be a bad situation. <clears throat> we could not be saved. But, but, if it depends on the one who is behind all the promises, well, then that's very different, isn't it? Because he'll take us all the way through. Our grasp on him may seem feeble, but his love is that of an elder brother. So long as we maintain our union, we don't pull out, no one can pluck us out of his hand. Isn't that good news today? You can have the assurance of your salvation. What a concept. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to go around saying, hey, I'm saved, I'm saved, bragging. No, no, that's not the way it is. But you can have that calm assurance, amen, that Jesus Christ is your Savior and that he loves you. You can have that assurance. The cross gives us that assurance. Now, this changes how we see others. I'm sorry, this changes how we see us. <clears throat> you, my friend, are a child of the Most High God. Can you say amen to that? Amen. You can somewhat stop obsessing about your faults. We all have faults. But there's a lot that is right with you, too. Amen? Because of what God did for you in Christ. And so this is a liberating message. You are a child of the Most High God. 
Now let him walk in you like it's true. There's a better way. Your value is intrinsic. He's put gifts in you. He's put blessings within you just waiting to come out. Oh, accept him and accept his gospel. I pray. It changes how we see others. Hurting people don't need to be told, well, <clears throat> you know, if you just do something first, then he'll, you know, help you out. No. <laughs> they do need to do something. I'm not saying they don't. But Christ already did something, amen, for hurting people. He already took their pain. If you'll just open your heart to him, he'll give you that peace, amen? It's a little different twist on how we take the gospel. Her value is intrinsic. It's built in also. Now, <clears throat> here's Mama Kangaroo and little Joey. What do they call the baby Joey? I don't know, but anyway, that's what they call it. Uh, <laughs> And so back to the in Christ motif. Where he went, you went. His faith is yours. Believe it and rest in it. Now think about this. The Sabbath truth. What is it built on? Are we just resting from our, because, you know, we work, work, work six days, and then we're just resting? Is that all it is? No. The Sabbath is built on the idea that we're resting in the perfect and the finished work of Christ for us. Amen? It's based on this objective truth that Christ died for the whole world. Rest in what? His perfect and finished work. Baptism. Baptism is also accepting his perfect life. Amen? That's what it's about. And so this is foundational. Okay, point number two. Christ died for all, for all, no conditions, no contingencies. God in Christ, this is all about the incarnation, came down and condemned sin in the flesh. Sinful addictions lose their grip once we accept the faith of Jesus. Now, usually when you have other churches, you'll either get one side of the gospel, well, yeah, Christ died for all, you be, or you'll get, uh, <clears throat> you know, God can, o can overcome sin, etc. With the true gospel, you have them both. Amen? Christ died for all, but that, that death and that life can be in you. Amen? Sinful addictions that once you gripped you lose their grip as we accept the faith of Jesus. Christ came all the way down, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, right? Which means, what does it mean? God with us. So Christ came all the way down. The Bible says he was tempted in all points like as we are. It also so says in every point that he was tempted, he is able to come to our aid. Now, if he was tempted in every single point, then how many points can he come to our aid? Every point, right? Every point. There's no point that he can't come to your aid that he doesn't want to come to your aid. He also... Now, look at the <clears throat> words that Paul uses here. I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. He also himself likewise. He, why does he use this abundance of words? Well, he's trying to make an emphatic point. He could have just said he took the same. That is flesh and blood, David's line. But he says he also himself likewise. That's being redundant. Whenever you see that in the Bible, there's a point being made there, an emphatic point. He also himself likewise took part of the same. That, through death, he might destroy him that had the power of the death, that is, that is the devil. So that's the good work that Christ did. He lived in flesh. He developed a perfect faith. He never sinned. What was lost in Adam was regained in Christ. Friend of mine today, I can tell you that God knows your disappointments. He knows your trials. He knows your joys. He knows, well, I know a lot has happened in your family. God isn't sitting up there. He knows exactly how you feel, amen? He's been tempted at all points like as we are, and, and yet more, right? When were we tempted to turn stones to bread? No, we can't do that. But he was tempted at every point. He knows our disappointments. He's touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He loves you today, friends. I hope you believe that. God knows your struggles. Christ came in the flesh. 
In every area that Jesus was tempted, he is able to come to your aid. No man can say that he is hopelessly subject to the bondage of sin. If you ever feel gripped by something in your life and think, man, I, just, I don't know if I can ever get over this. No, 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 please don't feel that way. Christ came. He can give you the victory in any area of your life. <clears throat> For what the law could not do, Romans 8, 3 says, because it was weak through the flesh, that is, the flesh was weak, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he, he condemned sin in the flesh. <clears throat> Christ already won the victory. Our weapons are mighty through God. He developed a perfect faith. Now, this is key. Because Revelation 14, 12 says, Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and keep what? Or have the faith of Jesus. Jesus, when he lived on this life, did he ever sin? Absolutely not. So his faith was perfect, right? Now he offers you that perfect faith to give as a gift. Your job is to accept it and allow it to work in you. And it's a process. Here's the gospel in a nutshell. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So, yeah, I'm dead with him, but no, no, I live. Yet, it's not I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by what? The faith of the Son of God who did what? Loved me and gave himself for me. me. Point number three. Not only are old habits gone, that's... Christ does that, but he wants to do more than that. They are replaced with a heart full of gratitude for the love of God. This faith will believe the impossible and do the impossible. Our motives will be purely for him. Now you might say, whoa, that's kind of out there. But it's true. God says he'll give you, in Philippians 2, both the will and the to-do of his good pleasure. Amen? Amen? So not just will you be doing things that are pleasing to God, he'll give you, you'll, you'll love it. You'll love it. Because God loves cheerful givers. <clears throat> Romans, I'm sorry, Revelation 14 says, these are they which are not defiled with the women, for they are virgins. This is symbolic. These are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever he goes. So you'll be just following your dear Jesus, a new law or a new principle takes control of the mind and heart. Point number four. This total heart surrender and reliance on his victory will deepen until every vestige of Christ is brought into our lives, leaving no room for sin. Now, does that mean that we can't sin? No, of course not. But let me ask you this. <clears throat> is it possible to not sin for any period of time? Now, uh, that's a trick question, I guess, right? But my, <laughs> my answer is yes. Now, here's how I say that. We have this nature that's always a rascal, right? It's always pulling us the wrong way. We'll have that until Jesus comes. But if we're completely surrendered and Christ is completely dwelling in us, is there any sin in Christ? Let me ask you that. There's not. So if he's completely dwelling in us and we're dead then are we going to be sinning? No, right? Christ can give victory. Don't miss this point. Christ can give complete and total victory in your lives and give you a joy for living the life of holiness. And in Revelation, it says, in their mouth was found no guile. That is, these people, the 144,000, they are without fault before the throne of God. Jude says, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Now to the only wise God. Point number five, and this is where we're closing. And this ties in with the cleansing of the sanctuary. What does it mean that the Adventists believe in the cleansing of the sanctuary? What's that all about? Well, this is what it's all about. I hope I can tie it together for you. <clears throat> God's way of saving people, which is illustrated in the sanctuary, will be fully seen through his people. The high priest will have completed his work and the sanctuary will be cleansed forever. You see, this whole thing is a great controversy that's begun from the very beginning. 
Satan said, well, you don't really know how to run things. You know, can, can I sit at the government, the head of the government? Let me run things. Well, we're seeing how Satan runs things. <laughs> pretty, pretty pathetic. But God has said, no, no, this system really works. It's based on the law of life for the universe, which is self-sacrifice, letting go of self. And Satan said, well, show me, you know, you say it works, show me a people. I mean, show me some evidence. And God says, I will. I will show you. I'm going to have a people that are so heart-surrendered that I will live in them fully before I come the second time to this earth. The high priest will have finished his work forever. This rest that the Sabbath is a sign of, we enter into this rest, trusting in Christ, will become the day of atonement rest. And this is a bit deep, but stay with me on it. <clears throat> Leviticus 16 talks about the day of atonement. So we believe that since 1844, we have entered into this day of atonement rest or experience. It's deeper than just the Sabbath. Okay, so in the Sabbath, if we're really understanding the Sabbath, we're resting in his perfect work of creating us, his perfect work of redeeming us. But that rest deepens and deepens until it becomes this rest. Humble your souls and do not do any work. And some of you are saying, you be. <laughs> no, no, no. That means just a, a complete, perfect rest in Christ. This has to do with your own works, really. Do not do any work, for it is on this day, the day of atonement, that atonement shall be made for you. It's not your work, it's his work. If we have to try harder, it isn't going to happen. Atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you, that you shall be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So Christ wants a humble, happy, holy, healthy people before he comes. Amen? People with smiles on their faces, not just coming to church because, oh, it's the Sabbath, I guess I have to do this. You know, Sabbath school lasts, I'm supposed to do that, check. Imagine getting to heaven. <clears throat> and Christ says, uh, or God says, well, I want you to the Holy City, oh, 600 hours. You're like, oh, 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 oh yes, sir. Do you really think it's going to be like that? Come on, talk to me. No, right? It's going to be a relationship of love. He's going to say, man, I, I want to meet with you in the Golden City. Can you guys come? Oh, you better believe it. I mean, we won't have to have any urging. Because the new life will be planted within our heart. Our greatest goal will be pleasing him. This is a poem that the Lord, I believe, gave me called Pleasing Him. And we close. What brings him joy is my desire. With bated breath I wait to hear his word and follow him. I will not hesitate. In pleasing him, I always find my greatest joy to be. His will is what my heart wants most. His happiness to see. And so we get beyond what makes us happy, but what makes him happy? What, what would make God happy today? Though worldly pleasures left behind, their mirth I shall not miss. It's him I strive to satisfy. His aim, my truest bliss. In all of life, I want one thing. To glorify the Lord. This is the experience that the 144,000 that God wants all of us to have now. In all of life, I want one thing, thing to glorify the Lord. For earthly prize, I struggle not. His desire is my reward. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for loving us, for sending Jesus to be the Savior of this world. And Lord, you've done something for each one of us. You've given us a measure of faith. It's as if salvation is ours today, even before we accepted it. But Lord, it really doesn't truly become ours. That is by way of, of acceptance and appreciation and enjoyment, unless we open the gift. Oh, Father, we're so, we're so grateful that you, you poured out all of heaven in the person of Jesus, that we might spend eternity to, with you. 
Please, Lord, change our heart desires. Write your law on our hearts. Write that new principle that will turn us towards loving what you love and hating what you hate and following you all the way to your kingdom because you are so worthy. Father, help us to be thinking more of your happiness and what you desire than what we desire and our happiness. And if that's our relationship, then we'll certainly love others as you did also. Thank you for loving us, for, for your liberating gospel today. Oh, what child is this that came at the incarnation so many years ago? In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen.